Hello vinyl community. So let's talk about another batch of records that have uh, accompanied me through the day and um, there's some really interesting stuff. Um, so um, kind of material away from the beaten track a little bit. First one is here. Um, it's an album from 1982 called Galaxy Cygnus R by Robert Schröder. This is a highly electronic uh, experimental album that was produced by Klaus Schulze. And uh, this was sort of a contribution for the Ars Electronica uh, exhibition in the Austrian city of Linz in 1982. And uh, that's a wonderful synthesizer album from the early 80s. Uh, that's really a good listen, very spheric of course, very... Uh, adventurous. Um, so that's the kind of music that's really good if you are, I don't know, working on a computer a lot and this is the stuff to have in your headphones. So I like this one. I'm not entirely sure but I think this is uh, Robert Schroeder's first album but um, maybe I'm wrong. I haven't looked that one up but uh, I think so. Now let's get to a collaboration that I find extremely exciting um, and that's the work of uh, Möbius and Planck. Um, they made three records together. This one is the first one, Rastakraut Pasta. Um, so this is a music with a very strong handwriting, so to speak. Um, you will not hear this kind of a uh, sound anywhere else. Now, of course, Dieter Möbius is uh, the member of uh, Cluster and Harmonia, and um, Connie Planck. Uh, it's not a name I need to introduce. I think. Um, I mean, that's basically the guy who recorded like 50% uh, of all <laughs> German progressive music in the 70s. And um, as I maybe said already, they made three records together in between, I think, 1980 and 1983. Um, this is a very minimalistic sound, but um, in parts uh, with really strong accents and uh, it's of a kind of a strange mixture of uh, avant-gardistic music and sort of a post-punk uh, sound. And um, yeah, it's, it has a great attitude, it has a certain musical humor. Um, so w when I started to listen to this I just knew yeah this will stay with me for years because this is quite fantastic. This is uh, really a, it's a bit of a tongue and a cheek music in parts but uh, always very cool. So as I said they made three albums together. This is the third one, um, Zero Set. Um, so on this third album um, they continue uh, their highly individualistic sound uh, with a third man in the fold together with uh, Manny Neumeyer uh, on drums and percussions. Um, the cover photograph, by the way, is uh, done in the, uh, in the old Elb Tunnel, uh, which is a quite a unique uh, place in Hamburg. Um, and... Um, at this point it might be just one of the most photographed uh, locations for music videos and uh, bands and stuff like that. Um, but um, 1983 when this photo was made uh, it was yet not as used up as it is now. <laughs> I think at this point it's, it has almost become a taboo for location scouts to even mention it. <laughs> because there's been so much stuff done in the old Elb Tunnel. So this is a tunnel that uh, leads under the river of Elbe in Hamburg and uh, this was something, I think this was uh, put in place in the beginning of 20th century, like around 1903 or 1905 and uh, uh, there are these giant um, uh, wooden elevators and so you can drive with your car into this giant wooden elevator and then you drive with your car like three or four uh, uh, levels below the ground and then you drive out and then you drive through this tunnel with these yellow stripes and on the other side it's the same. Um, which is 
in this time and age when everybody is rather hectic and uh, always uh, looking for lost time it's not very practical so uh, even though um, well it's been it has been in use I when I was in the Alp tunnel the last time it's like uh, uh, maybe 10 or 15 years ago it was still in use but more or less just for kicks because uh, it was not practical and there is a modern Alp tunnel that everybody's using for, I mean those people that have to go to work or something <laughs> but because it takes time to get through this elevator but um, this of course has nothing to do with the music um, this album is really great this is a really a powerful record uh, and if you are looking for interesting and highly individual and original music um, that doesn't sound like all the rest that's the one for you most certainly so what next um, yeah um, I've been listening quite a lot to the album Waves by Terry Eriptal and uh, it's another great musician from Scandinavia. So this is a late 70s album uh, recorded in Oslo in 1977. Um, the sound is very particular I would say. Um, on the one hand it's a very very uh, intense uh, uh, jazz fusion music but it's combined with all these very spheric uh, elements uh, sort of a there's a there's there's a prog prog rock feel about it but just without the rock element it's more like prog ambient if you want and um yeah it's cool album i think uh, in in certain circles this is quite legendary and very revered and i like it it's certainly one i've listened a few times uh, in the last days and that I mean, it tends to disappear in my collection for some years, but every time I come across uh, Waves by Terry Riptal, uh, it's always a great joy to listen to it again. Now, uh, in a bit of a similar vein uh, uh, is uh, this album, which is a bit of a odd thing. Now, uh, this has been kind of... Uh, so there has been this weird effort to market this as a Mike and Sally Oldfield album, um, which is completely bonkers because that is not the case. This is a Peggy Poyola album, and uh, this has this, this had already been released in in Finland uh, some years prior to the release date in, uh, in here in Germany. It came out by uh, on a label called Happy Bird in 1981. And uh, yeah, this is a Peke Poyola album. It's a, it's a very sort of a prog rock uh, with a touch of fusion. Uh, and uh, it's quite interesting. Uh, there are some very beautiful, calm tracks on it. And there are a lot of tracks that are rather quite geometric, so to speak. And yes, there's a lot of Mike Oldfield on it. Uh, but it's still not his album. <laughs> it's just what they printed on the cover uh, with this rather terrible graphic design um, yes Pierre Morlin is drumming here which is always uh, certainly uh, for me a, a reason uh, to buy a record and um, you have like uh, you have like Georgi Vadenius playing guitar so it's not only it's not only um, Mike Oldfield uh, on the guitars and uh, yeah and of course Peggy Poyola playing bass and some synthesizers. So this is a very good record. It's really enjoyable. Um, I mean, this whole, it's just, it's just kind of uh, uh, tainted by this weird hoax to market it as something which it is not. But nevertheless, uh, it's a great record. And um, I guess if you are a collector, you probably are going for the original uh, Finnish uh, release anyway. But this was a really a uh, cheap purchase and uh, I certainly could not say no. So uh, what, else, um, what else have I been listening to? Let me have a look here in my stack. Now this is the debut album by Tears for Fears, The Hurting. It's quite a wonderful album. I think this came out in 
83, yes. Uh, so that's when this band started. Uh, so this is a group from uh, from Bath, I think, which is uh, Western England. Um, and this is a this is a very intense album. I mean, the themes are quite gloomy. Um, at the same time, it's a wonderful uh, example of sort of early '80s uh, pop music, uh, but uh, very conceptual in a sense, very uh, drastic, uh, with a lot of attitude and uh, with a lot of uh, inherent sadness. Um, so um, the the themes are abuse and violence and uh, kind of what it meant for these guys probably to grow up in the 70s uh, in this uh, well rather middle-sized city uh, um, in the west of, uh, of, of Great Britain so wonderful record um, but uh, while I was at it I just continued with this famous one uh, songs from the big chair uh, their second album. Um, well, there are of course some well-known hits on that one, um, but it's a it's a good ride to listen to these both albums in a row. Um, makes quite sense. Uh, there is a certain development uh, between those two records, um, but uh, I kind of regard them both uh, in the uh, on the same level, so to speak. I mean, this one it was probably significantly more successful. Yet, uh, the intensity of the hurting is, of course, uh, something that makes it very, very unique. So, uh, I can recommend both records quite a lot. So, uh, one more record, then uh, I will uh, push the stop button. <laughs> and uh, this is uh, Inside Story by Grace Jones. Uh, and um, this is a pretty cool uh, sort of a disco funk oriented uh, album it was produced by Nile Rogers and uh, Grace Jones uh, together and um, I don't know there there have been all these rumors that uh, this was not a very harmonious uh, collaboration but uh, you wouldn't tell from listening to this record uh, it's a pretty cool sounding uh, album I think it came out in 19... 86 I think uh, let me have a look um, well maybe I can find out quickly oh yeah 1986 uh, Manhattan Records this was the only um, collaboration between Grace Jones and Manhattan Records um, the, she, after this album she changed the label again um, this was a rather I think it was a rather successful album. Um, it has some really great tracks on it. Uh, I mean, the one thing that might be uh, regarded as problematic with this album is probably just the fact that uh, this kind of a uh, this kind of a disco slash funky sound was pretty much out of fashion in 1986. Probably this might have put some people off, but I mean, in hindsight, this plays no role if you are listen, listening to it. Um, this is a great record um, and um, yeah, always kind of a contender for my favorite uh, Grace Jones album, but that one is always changing through the years. So um, that's uh, the inside story by Grace Jones and uh, um, enough for today. So um, have a nice day and uh, see you another time. Bye-bye.